A lot of times people, you know, the conversation comes up and, you know, why certain people are not in the Hall of Fame. You've been asked this many times. You know, you've been on the Conan O'Brien, I think it was Conan O'Brien show, where he asked you about, hey, do these guys belong, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, it always comes up with bonds. Do you put the asterisk? Do you put all this stuff? I saw this picture I want to share with you. How much of this picture hurts you <laughs> getting into the Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, if you look at it, it's a 10-year cycle. Yeah. You go on five years after you retire, and you're on the ballot for 10 years. Um, and for me, I've always been asked, if I was the Hall of Fame, I wouldn't be in my Hall of Fame. Because to me, the Hall of Fame is I say a name, and you say yes. Or if you pause, then it's a no. Huh. You know, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guarantee. You know, if I say Mario Rivera, you say yes. If Greatest I, closer of all time. Right. And if I say somebody like Andy Pettit, you're going to sit and think for a minute. Right. Anybody you have to think about to me shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Huh. So I'm not in mine, and I'm okay with that. But when you look at the vote totals over 10 years, I, I never won a game or struck out a hitter after I retired. But my vote totals change yearly. And that to me, that was always, you know, one and done for me would have been fine. For, from and, and after about five years, the process became so painful at home that – I just dreaded every, the year, the time of the year coming around because of the things that were said. And, you know, I think it goes back. What well, I know it started the, the day we won in 04, the day after we won in 04, 86 year curse and all the stuff that goes with that. I was on Good Morning America with the Red Sox or something. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I was one of the Disney guys. You know, I, I, after the game, I said, hey, we're going to Pedro and, and David and I were the Disney guys. So Meaning, that, hey, you just won the World right, Series. Where right, are you right. going? So we're, we're going to Disney. Right. Thanks, Kurt Schilling. So on the, we flew back from St. Louis, and and it was just an unbelievable morning. And I was doing Good Morning America with Charles Gibson at the end of the It was right around the election in 2004. And I said, hey, at the end of the election, uh, at the end of the show, I said to Charles Gibson, I said, hey, make sure you tell everybody to go out and vote and vote Bush. <laughs> well, I didn't think, right? I'm, I'm in New England. You know, Don Kerry grew up five minutes from where I'm giving. Uh, and Charles Gibson's looking at me, and there's like a 10-second pregnant pause of su Nobody said anything, and I'm like, this is awkward. And he's like, yeah, okay. And after that, <laughs> it just went nuts. I got a call from President Bush like 20 minutes later. Hey, I want you to come campaign with me. And, blah. and the Red Sox went nuts. They were like, we don't want you to do this, and, and we don't want you to get involved. And then they started flying John Kerry around on the owner's private jet when I was so it started then, and our charity suffered. We lost tens of millions of dollars. Uh, we work, we've worked with ALS for almost 30 years. And uh, my wife's uh, Melanoma Foundation lost sponsorships and all the things to go with that. And it just steamrolled, um, and that was the beginning. I, the beginning of the end for me was, and if you, I think if you, and I, I've, I've researched this, so I, I'm comfortable saying this, I believe that I was kind of ground zero of the cancel movement. I was the first guy to really get canceled for doing nothing. I compared Islamic extremists to Nazis, which historically is factually perfectly correct. I said men should use the men's room and women should use the women's room. Uh, I said Hillary Clinton shouldn't just be in jail. She should be under a jail somewhere, which she still should be. Um, and then I uh, commented on a picture of trans, trans bathroom law, and that was the one that ended up being the one that ESPN fired me for. Out of all of those, that's the one that got ESPN. Yeah, yeah, and... and I, I, I would like to think it was because I was really, really good at what I did that they kind of held back and held back. But, but it, was the, it was the weirdest working environment. I mean, I can't tell you how many hundreds, of, hundreds, and I, say, I mean hundreds, of people the ESPN would come up and say, it was like, hey, I'm, I'm with you politically. I can't say anything, but I'm with you. I'm with, and it was just really awkward and uncomfortable. You know, it's crazy. When I was there interviewing Stephen A. Smith, Okay, and we were, I was with Ray Dalio, and then afterwards we contacted him and said, come on by, let's do it in New York. So uh, I go sit down, I'm here getting ready to talk to Stephen A., and we want to talk politics and sports, right? And you see one of his guys, handlers, comes up and says, hey, Pat, look, we follow your content, we know what you're doing, just please don't talk politics. I said, dude, that's what he wants to talk about. Right. You can't talk politics. I said, that's what he wants to talk You can't talk politics. You can't talk politics. You can't talk politics. He hmm. says, if you talk politics, producer's saying you can't do the interview. Anyways, long story short, what do we talk about? Sports, right? So they're standing right there while I'm doing the interview. And every time you get close to, they would come behind the camera and signal. And, uh, and then just recently, Stephen, Stephen A. launched a podcast. I don't right. know if you saw that or not. And the first guest he had on was Chris Cuomo. You know who right. his second oh, guest yeah. was? Sean Hannity, Hannity. Right. was a second guest. And it was on Fox uh, being interviewed by Waters. And Waters said, am I your favorite host on Fox? He says, no, my good friend Sean Hannity. So... I kind of like where he's going. Obviously, he's still going to play 
to the ESPN. But the fact that he's even talking about it, that's some progress. I think we're starting to see that with a lot of hard left. I, I, I went out on Stephen A. Smith when in, uh, in the, when Washington, Robert Griffin was in Washington, and uh, he was benched because he sucked. And, and uh, Stephen A. tried to make it a, a, a debate about color. And it wasn't. And he did that. He did it all. I've heard nothing but great things of people that have met Stephen. I don't really know him. I didn't get really get to know him. But now imagine, imagine me at ESPN. And I'm very comfortable being who I am and, and saying the things I say. Can you imagine what the producers were like every night for baseball tonight, worried about a comment? <laughs> because, you know, and, oh my God. And, we, and we used to have fun in the green room. I would talk to the guys. And once the Trump announced he was running, I said, listen, guys, take the under. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, the over-under on me being fired by March of next year is I would take the under because if Trump's running, there's going to be problems. And I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have an issue talking and saying how I feel about things. And people are going to have a big problem. When you started saying stuff about Trump, did, did that cause anything at first or they were okay with that? Well, I was never, I, I, I mean, I was never blatant. Well, you, and you know this as well as anybody. The things that are said and done are very uh, – there's a chasm between those things and what people report was said and done, right? I mean, the, the, well, for example – I'll give you a great example. Uh, I have been in the World War, the board of directors uh, of the World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, I helped put the Richard Winters statue over in Bercourt Manor in, in France. And, and World War II, military history has always been a passion of mine. Clearly grew up a flag-waving patriot. My dad was – my whole family served in all different branches – and I have a very large collection of World War II memorabilia. And I'm dumb and I'm naive in the sense that I, I believe in the inherent good in people. And I had a young lady from the Boston Globe ask to come out and, and do a story about my collection. Which I was like, great, that's awesome. I have General Bernard Montgomery's beret, the one you see him in in pictures. I have that. Wow. And all wow, the, the iconic Wow. Yes, yes. And I have all the correspondence. I have all these things. I have stuff from Patton, I have everything. And she came out and she she left and did the story and the story came out and it was a picture of uh, some uh, German uniforms and it said Kurt Schilling's Nazi memorabilia collection. That's what the title. That said. was the story. The entire story was about that, and I was just flabbergasted. I was crushed. Be I mean, again, I'm. A, I'm what a, year is this? This was probably less than 10 years ago. This was during the Hall of Fame stuff. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.